Thank you, Tim. It's really great to be back here. I was saying to Noah, just walking in the building is a great memory for the times I've been here. So thank you for organizing this. It's good to see some friends here. Uh, thanks for coming out tonight. I hope that this will be encouraging to you. In the west country of England, there sits the beautiful city of Bath. Filled with fine Georgian buildings, it's a visual treat to visit. At the beginning of the 19th century, Bath was the most fashionable resort in English society. Jane Austen lived there from 1801 to 1806, and she set two of her novels, Persuasion and Northanger Abbey, in Bath. In fact, if you watch late 18th or early 19th century period dramas produced in England, you've probably seen Bath and its buildings as the background, as sets for the production. Among the graceful buildings at the heart of this fashionable part of the city, you will find the Bath Assembly Rooms. In 1771, they were described as the most noble and elegant of any in the kingdom. The building is an impressive sight from outside and even better within. Imagine passing through an entryway constructed of a facade of four brownstone columns, eventually finding yourself in a beautiful room with glass chandeliers above and ornate, ornately decorated walls with crown molding and ornamental flourishes everywhere you look. It's not difficult to imagine the elaborate balls that would have been held there. On a cold December Saturday, it was the 15th of December in 1832, a day when there would only be eight hours of sunlight, it rose around eight in the morning and it set around four in the afternoon, two men stood before a large and respectable assembly gathered in these elegant Bath assembly rooms. One of them, named Peter Borthwick, called the room to order and proposed the matter for discussion. Mr. Borthwick had been hired by the planters of Jamaica, the English landholders and slave owners, to represent their interest in England. He asserted that the recent uprising of slaves in Jamaica had been instigated by English missionaries, primarily the other man who would speak, the Baptist missionary William Nibb. Mr. Borthwick asked Mr. W.T. Blair, Esquire, to chair the meeting and Mr. Blair began to address those present. Mr. Nibb would speak first, and then Mr. Borthwick would reply. The atmosphere of the room was charged with emotion because Borthwick had leveled serious allegations against the character of William Nibb, accusations bordering on slander and defamation, and Nibb now stood before this assembly to reply. One imagines that every eye was fixed on him as he stood in defense, every ear straining to listen to the words that he would speak. I wonder, what were his facial expressions? What was his body language? Did he begin with soft words and build to a crescendo? There was a pamphlet that was produced from a shorthand account of the occasion. In it, Nib's remarks fill 16 pages of small print. And having read them, I would estimate that he spoke for at least an hour and perhaps more likely for two hours. Borthwick was allotted the same amount of time, though he exceeded this and was only allowed to continue after agreeing to grant Nib a further quarter of an hour. The account indicates that there were interruptions, speeches by others, and by the end, a chaotic scene erupted, a new chairman was appointed, and the assembly was asked to express its approval or disapproval of each man's presentation. In the words of the report, I quote, the chairman put it to the meeting whether they were satisfied that Mr. Nibb was guiltless of the charges brought against him or not. On a show of hands, he declared he considered his duty to pronounce that there was a decided majority in favor of Mr. Nibb. Then after speeches by two gospel ministers, one of them, Mr. T. Spencer, an Anglican who spoke in support of Nib, he said this, we ought as a body to express our sentiments of Mr. Borthwick. Either we approve of his character or we do not. And then something happened that I really don't even know how to figure out. The, the record says three groans were given for Mr. Borthwick. What's that mean? Oh, oh, oh. Three groans for Mr. Borthwick, and after three cheers, 
Huzzah! For Mr. Nib, the meeting separated. Black letters on a white page can hardly express the scene as it must have occurred. But we need to ask the question, why was this meeting even necessary? What's behind this fascinating event? At least it's fascinating to me. What's behind it? Well, maybe there's a metaphor here. The cold, dark December day outside, representing the hardships of a life of oppression and fear, the bright lamp-lit and fashionable interior standing for the wealth and comfort of those who profited from the subjugation of others. But this only leads us backwards to think about the circumstances leading to this day. Slavery is a bad word in our modern discourse, but it was not always so. In fact, for the majority of the history of the world, it was an accepted fact of life. In some societies, it still is. In the old world, Europe, Asia, and Africa, slavery was the benefit of the powerful and the bane of the weak. From ancient times, conquerors forced their defeated enemies into bondage, using their labor and toil for the benefit of the ruler and his domain. When Europeans came to the New World, they brought this practice with them. The Spanish were the first, steamrolling through the Caribbean islands, Central and South America, murdering and enslaving the Native Americans they encountered. They also brought with them diseases to which the natives had no immunity, so that it is suggested that up to 90% of the population of North, South, and Central America died within a century of European settlement. As word of Spanish conquest spread, others sought benefits from the New World. Dutch, Portuguese, French, English expeditions all wanted the bounties of these unknown lands. When you read the accounts proposing exploratory journeys, there's one word that appears over and over and over again. You know what the word is? It's the word gold. Gold. Whether it was the mythical city of El Dorado that attracted the conquistadors, or the promise of unimaginable riches set before English investors of the Virginia Company, gold was at the root of European expansion. Of course, the boasts that there were men clad in gold dress or mountainsides covered in gold nuggets were the empty bluster of charlatans seeking investment. They were advertisers of their day. And there were no great sources of gold that were found so easily. But there was plenty of wealth to be found in the New World. Tobacco, sugarcane, coffee, furs, and many other pro products would fill the desires of the wealthy in their comfortable European homes. In order to gather them, it soon became evident that a massive workforce was needed to harvest the bounty on the other side of the Atlantic. And this was filled by the importation of slaves. Now we're interested in Jamaica. Christopher Columbus himself visited the island on his third journey. He claimed it for Spain, and the Spanish nearly annihilated the native inhabitants and in their place imported a small number of African slaves. The first cash crop in Jamaica was tobacco, but it was inferior to the product grown on other islands, such as Cuba, and Spain lost interest in Jamaica and its possibilities. The English, seeing an opportunity for acquisition, invaded in 1655 and established what would become the most important English settlement in the Caribbean. After driving out the Spaniards, attempt at cultivation began. It was discovered that Jamaican soil produced the finest sugar cane in the Caribbean, and workers were imported. At first, as in most of the American English colonies, the servants were white Europeans who had been transported to the New World, often as punishment for petty crimes. When the Irish were forced off their lands, or the Scottish Covenanters were arrested, they were shipped to work in the plantations in the New World. But Europeans were not well suited for the intense labor of a tropical climate, and many of them died within a few years of their arrival. So the English turned to Africa for labor. After the restoration of Charles II to the English throne, settlement increased dramatically, and so did the slave trade. The famous Atlantic Triangle developed. Products of labor, such as sugar or rum, were shipped from the Americas to England. Profits from the sale of these were applied to the manufacture of goods that were shipped from England to West Africa, 
and bartered for slaves, which were then shipped back to the Americas, a triangle. It was a lucrative economic system, and all the participants were guilty. In Africa, tribal warfare produced captives who were forcibly marched by the conquering tribe to the western shore and sold to European traders. Ships, inhumanely packed with captives, then sailed westward across the Atlantic to plantations on islands and the mainland where the human cargo were bartered for profit. And then these men, women, and children were forced into terrible labor. It is estimated that by the year 1800, there were more than 300,000 African slaves in Jamaica. These served a white population of about 15,000. That's a ratio of 20 to 1, 20 slaves for every white person on the island. The white population is generally called the planters. They were wealthy, comfortable, and made enormous profits from slave labor. They developed an aristocratic lifestyle mirroring society in their homeland. From their perspective, the slaves seemed to have been nothing more than beasts to be used and disposed. They gave little thought to the physical well-being of their slaves and even less for their spiritual benefit. While the planters attended Anglican services held in fine buildings in the towns, the slaves had no benefit of Christian witness until late in the 18th century. The first to begin work among the slaves were the Moravians, followed by the Methodists, then the Baptists, and the Presbyterians also joined at a later date. Curiously, the Moravians and the Presbyterians had the best situations because they were allowed to hold services on the plantations themselves. And sometimes this actually meant conniving with the planters so that gospel witness was confused with aristocratic lifestyle. And the Methodists and the Baptists were always the lowest on the social scale. The Baptist involvement in Jamaica came from an interesting source. A freed slave from Virginia, his name was George Lyle, who seems to have been converted and became a preacher while in the southern colonies, made his way to Jamaica and began to work among the slaves. He found shocking spiritual conditions. The slaves had all been forced together on the plantations and had lost any sense of their unique tribal heritage and identities. As a result, they had developed a way of life and religion that reflected general African beliefs rather than any one specific set of them. They believed in many gods, practiced forms of black magic, and followed no real system of morality. They had been prevented from marrying and had simply begun to live together in constantly shifting relationships. Men and women changed partners constantly. Children were often raised by mothers alone. In cases where couples carried out relationships similar to marriage, either partner could be sold at any time and the relationship permanently dissolved. Even after Christian marriage was introduced, this was a major problem and caused the missionaries no small difficulty. The planters observed this heathen lifestyle and they proclaimed the slaves unfit for religion and society. Only two and a half months after his discussion with Nib in Bath, Peter Borthwick was back in the assembly rooms saying this, I quote, before the Afri Africans were received by the planter, they were savages in their native country of the lowest possible description. They knew nothing of moral ties they had no wants of a moral kind. They cared not for anything save the gratification of their passions. Of course, this is not true. African society was actually well-developed and maintained levels of morality similar to European society. And yet, sadly, it was all too easy to believe these lies and slanders when spoken to the English audiences who received them. Interestingly, when Christian missionaries came to Jamaica, they noted that morality among the planters was thoroughly evil. Drunkenness, fornication, adultery, murder, and many other sins characterized white society just as much as the slave. In fact, some missionaries believed that the morals of the planters were worse than those of the slaves. And yet the planters consistently used the state of slave morality as evidence of the propriety of slavery. The argument was something like this. These people live like beasts. They deserve no better than to be treated as beasts. 
My comment is if only the planters had looked in the mirror, if only they had seen what their lives were like. Well, George Lyle, the freed American slave, did what he could, but he needed help. In December 1791, the year before the formation of the Baptist Missionary Society, Lyle wrote to the important London Baptist pastor, John Rippon, asking for help to build a chapel for the slaves that he was serving. Rippon published the letter, and the cause was growing, and the planters were unhappy. In 1806, they passed a law in their House of Assembly specifically prohibiting Christian missionary work on the plantations. One of Lyle's converts, Moses Baker, formed a church and in the face of growing opposition from the planters, wrote to John Ryland of the Baptist Missionary Society, explaining the great needs of the hundreds of thousands in the slave population. It wasn't until 1813 that the BMS, Baptist Missionary Society, sent its first worker, John Rowe, to assist Baker in his work. Now, you may remember that the BMS was founded in Kettering, Northamptonshire, in 1792. Its efforts at the beginning were primarily directed toward India, but the bold step of sending Carey brought the cause of missions front and center in English Christian life, and many people took notice. Among them was a boy born in this same town, Kettering, in 1803, 11 years after the BMS was formed. He was the fifth child of Thomas and Mary Nibb, born alongside a twin sister, Anne. His father was a tradesman and not particularly re religious. His mother was a member of the Congregational Church in Kettering with a good testimony for Christ. William seems to have been an above average student but didn't distinguish himself in his studies. Like William Carey, it's said that he was diligent and thorough so that once he embarked on a project, he was sure to finish it. He was well liked by all of the other children and he seems to have been the local champion at the game of marbles. Who knew? He spent every possible moment playing. He won money from his friends, which he used to purchase issues of the youth's magazine. One of his sisters said of him, quote, the chief traits of his early character were warm affection, unbounded generosity, management and economy accompanied by great vivacity. Looking back, we can notice early in his life that the Lord gave him traits which would serve him well in his adult years. William's older brother and the eldest child in the family was named Thomas. He was born in October 1799. Thomas was an excellent student and he and William were very close. They attended church together and one of his teachers challenged his class to recite within the next week as many questions as possible from the shorter catechism, the winner to receive six pence. Well, Thomas not only recited the shorter catechism and all its proofs, but three of Isaac Watts's catechisms with their proofs, the entire epistle of James, the first four chapters of Proverbs, and several Psalms. His teacher actually stopped him at 9 p.m. and awarded the sixpence, <laughs> knowing that no other student would even come close to Thomas's ability. Thomas gained an apprenticeship with J.G. Fuller, a printer and the son of Andrew Fuller of the Baptist Missionary Society. In 1816, J.G. Fuller moved to Bristol and took with him Thomas and the 13-year-old William. They began to attend the Broadmead Bristol Reformed Baptist Church, and Thomas was converted, and then William, who was baptized by John Ryland on the 7th of March, 1822, he was 19 years old. Thomas had long been interested in missionary work, and early in the same year, 1822, offered himself as a school teacher to assist the Baptist mission in Jamaica. He was accepted by the BMS committee in July, sailed for Jamaica in October, and arrived in December, 1822. I guess he got out of the cold English winter and ended up in the Caribbean in Jamaica in December. William became greatly interested in gospel work and began to hold Bible classes in an unreached part of Bristol. The work grew, and William increasingly sensed a desire to follow his brother to the foreign field and serve as a missionary. Meanwhile, Thomas sent home encouraging letters about his work as a teacher, while William pursued holiness in the service of Christ. But on April 25, 1823, just 18 months after arriving in Jamaica,
Thomas became ill and died three days later. William returned to Kettering to be with his family, stating that he felt, quote, a more earnest desire to be made useful in his day and generation than ever before. Almost immediately, William offered to go to Jamaica and take his brother's place. On August the 12th, the BMS committee accepted William's offer and preparations for the trip to Jamaica began. Now, it must be remembered that William Nibb went to Jamaica as a school teacher, not as a preaching missionary. The events that took place later demonstrate how God thrusts men into positions they perhaps do not seek and equips them for tasks they do not expect. Upon arrival in Jamaica, William found that the schoolhouse had been neglected and needed significant repair. There were no books for the students and few who were interested in education. The planters were opposed to the plan since they feared that education would equip the slaves with dangerous ideas and would lead to the end of their way of life. Finding no help from the English establishment, Nibs set out to fulfill his task as he was able. Through resourcefulness, diligence, and a strong will, he recruited students, repaired the building, and began the process of helping to raise the standard of living among the slaves. Teaching school occupied him Monday through Saturday, and believing that he could be useful on the Sabbath as well, he began a school of Christian teaching, we'd call it a Sunday school, on the Lord's Day. The Baptist cause began to grow, and Nib found himself leading a large and growing congregation of Christians. It was illegal for him to do so, since he had not been accredited by the government as a pastor, but he had no choice. There was no one else to serve his congregation. Nib, <coughs> pardon me, Nib trained his men, elevated 50 of them to positions of leadership among their fellow sl slaves. Essentially, he was building a church where black and white served on an equal basis, and this was perceived as a threat in a society where 10% ruled over and dominated 90%. In such a society, an action like Nibs was a threat to the planter's way of life. The slaves were realizing that if black and white could be equal in heaven, they could also be equal on earth. And Nibs certainly believed that this was true. His hands were tied by the political circumstances of the day, but he did much to move society forward to, toward abolition and emancipation. As he looked at the society around him, he was appalled by what he observed, both among the unconverted slaves and the planters. He came to realize that the degradation of the slaves was largely the result of policies put in place by the planters and that they themselves were wicked through and through. His work was opposed by the landowners and the Anglican clergymen, and he faced opposition at almost every step. Nib could not stand to watch the chain gangs, the whippings and beatings, the inhumane treatment that was handed out to slaves on a daily basis. They were worked from sunup to sundown with little rest and no relief. They were forced to labor in the tropical heat and sun, and they were denied even the most basic of comforts. In 1826, the planters, through their House of Assembly, passed a slave act specifically aimed at the work of missionaries. Listen to what it was. It prohibited any religious meetings for slaves between sundown and sunrise, so the nighttime. Prohibited it, which of course means that there could be no services for them at all since they worked all day. It likewise prohibited slave contributions to their own chapels. They it was illegal for the slaves to help build buildings that they could meet in. The support of missionaries depended on contributions from home, and these were less frequent than necessary. And it prohibited preaching on the part of all slaves. They could not, under any circumstances, preach. Let me tell you about an incident from 1828. While Nib was nil, I'm sorry, yeah. While Nib was ill, Sam Swinney, a deacon in Nib's church, met with others from the congregation to pray for his recovery. Swinney led the believers in prayer, and this was reported to the authorities who arrested him. Nib stood before the magistrate and argued that there was a significant difference between prayer and preaching, but the magistrate turned a deaf ear and sentenced Sam Swinney to punishment. The next day, Sam was publicly flogged, 
then chained and forced to work on a chain gang for a month because he prayed. He didn't preach, he prayed. Nib stood behind him, beside him. Nib stood beside him the whole time, urging him to endure the maltreatment with patience and raised a loud cry to tell all that this was nothing but religious persecution. He published an account of the event in a small paper on the island. He faced a libel suit as a result. But more and more, William Nib cried out against the unjust and inhumane treatment that was meted out on the Jamaican slaves. Of course, we've said Jamaica was a British colony. In 1807, due to the efforts of men like William Wilberforce, British involvement in the slave trade was ended. But it must be remembered that this was only the first step. Slavery was still permitted by law. Nib was laboring in a colony that could no longer import slaves, but which depended on slaves to satisfy its economy. After 1807, there was a gradual decrease in the slave population due to death, and pressures on the planters and the slaves grew. As the able-bodied workforce diminished, tasks for the remaining slaves increased, and the planters feared that any steps toward the reduction of the number of workers would bring about greater difficulties. In response, they stepped up their pressure and opposition to the missionaries. In addition, there was a growing sentiment that Parliament in London was preparing to enact abolition and emancipation. Circumstances were very tense, storm clouds were on the horizon, and could break at any time. Now there's another factor that must be considered. While the Baptists were very successful at bringing slaves into their churches, there was another powerful religious movement alive that was out of control of the missionaries. The planters called the participants native Baptists, but this was not an accurate name. It was a slur that was aimed at the Baptist missionaries. In reality, native Baptist was a catch-all phrase used to describe the multitude of slaves who followed a combination of traditional native religion mingled with forms of Christianity. It was a hybrid of revivalist evangelicalism brought to Jamaica by slaves fleeing the southern U.S. states with religious practices that had developed among the Africans over the years. Many of these practices resembled older African observances, but they were really the combination of tribal acts from many different groups. Some slaves claimed to have magical powers and promoted their own forms of religion. The missionaries found that many of the slaves could not understand the kind of preaching practiced in England. One Presbyterian spoke about preaching several sermons about God, only to realize that his congregation had not understood a single concept he had proclaimed to them. Their traditional religion had no place for a high God, a ruler over all, who was a judge of men and demanded righteousness. For them, lesser gods were of greater importance. Gods who could do something about crops and rain and provision. In fact, the slaves did not fear death, but celebrated it, believing that it was a happy, permanent reunion of those separated on earth. For them, it was a paradise of freedom. When the Christian preachers spoke of sin and righteousness and judgment, of a God who was creator and sovereign Lord, the slaves had no categories by which to process these ideas. And the result for many was what has been called Native Baptists. It was the use of some Christian terms redefined into traditional African categories and then practiced by the people. Led by slaves who often set themselves up as religious leaders, it was a powerful alternative to the Christian message preached by the white missionaries. Curiously, Christmas became the time when the Native practices were the most obvious. Tribal drumming and dancing was heard from the slave quarters of the plantations all night long. One missionary stated that he hoped that the drumming would cease and he might awaken to the sound of carols being sung. See, the merger of Christian and native religion did not work well. Of course not. Subsequent events would demonstrate that even many members of the Baptist churches were influenced by the shadowy religion which spread among the slave population on the plantations. Rumors spread among the churches and into the native Baptist community that the English parliament was on the verge of passing laws of emancipation. Slaves expected that every ship that came into port would bring this news with them, and every time they were disappointed. Some determined to take matters into their own hands, 
probably in the autumn of 1831, several slave leaders began to talk about resistance. They urged their fellows to join in a movement to refuse to participate as slaves any longer. And it was decided that at Christmas of that year, the slaves would simply sit down in the sugarcane fields and refuse to work. Leadership intended the protest to be nonviolent. They knew that the white masters would retaliate, but they hoped for the best and agreed that some sacrifice on the part of a few might bring greater benefits to the whole. The most important leader of this protest was a man named Sam Sharp. He organized the Native Baptists alongside many members of Baptist chapels in an attempt to act against the planters. While he spoke of nonviolent resistance, he seems also to have prepared for armed conflict. Soon after the event began, it rapidly degenerated into skirmishes, and the untrained and poorly armed slaves very quickly were overrun by the British soldiers and the militia. The participants were brutally punished, and even many who had no part at all were implicated and sentenced. Hundreds were publicly hung, their bodies left on the gallows for all to see until the next group of insurgents replaced them. The planters named this rebellion the Baptist War and quickly turned the white population against the missionaries. Baptist chapels were burned to the ground or destroyed. Most of the missionaries were arrested and jailed as supporters or pe perhaps even as instigators of the rebellion. Nib and all of the others insisted that they had no part at all in the events but they were held for long periods of time. When they came to trial, no charges could be proven and the missionaries were released, but things had become very difficult. Nib returned to England to seek to allay the situation and to lobby for final emancipation and abolition. It was during this visit to the home country that he had his encounter with Peter Borthwick in Bath. Borthwick asserted that Nib had been deeply involved in the uprising Nib protested his innocence. The immediate effect of the Baptist War was brutal repression, but the long-term result was freedom. Near the end of his remarks made at that meeting in Bath, Nib said this, I quote, aid me, British Christians, by your prayers. Aid me by your exertions. Aid me by your sympathies. And ere that devoted servant of God, Wilberforce, descends to the tomb, let the attendant angel, as he descends to waft his spirit to the abodes of the blessed, whisper in the ears of the dying saint that Africa is free. Sadly, Wilberforce died a month before Parliament passed the Emancipation Bill, but it was passed, and on August 1st, 1834, a form of emancipation was declared. It required that slaves fulfill a six-year period of apprenticeship in order to be free. But this was not yet the end. The planters used every opportunity to abuse their slaves, and Parliament finally passed an act for full emancipation to go into effect on August the 1st, 1838. Nib tells us that on the night of July 31st, 1838, his people assembled together at their chapel for a service of worship. They determined to spend the last hour of slavery in prayer and at midnight, they rejoiced together at the provision of freedom. What a fitting way to end the long nightmare of oppression in the worship of God. Nib addressed the meeting, a meeting that was held the next day. He said this, I here pledge myself by all that is solemn and sacred, never to rest satisfied until I see my black brethren in the enjoyment of the same civil and religious liberties which I myself enjoy, and see them take a proper stand in society as men. That was at a, a meeting in Falmouth, Jamaica on August the 1st, 1838, the first day of freedom for the slaves. Exactly one year later, at a meeting of the Falmouth Auxiliary Anti-Slavery Society, Nib said this, the same God who made the white man made the black man. The same blood that runs in the white man's veins flows in yours. It's not the complexion of the skin, but the complexion of character that makes the great difference between one man and another. Oh, those are powerful words, aren't they? We're told that the seven years following emancipation brought a vast bounty of souls into the kingdom of God. Thousands professed their faith in submission to Christ. One wonders 
Was this because the white missionary sacrificed, identified with the slaves, suffered opposition, and stood with them? Had they won the love and respect of those they sought to reach by their committed and sacrificial acts of love? In November 1845, William Nibb suddenly fell ill. Like his brother Thomas 23 years before, he only lasted a few days. He died peacefully and passed into the presence of his Savior. It's said that 8,000 people came to pay tribute as, at his funeral. His wife, we haven't even mentioned the fact that he had a wife, his wife survived him by 25 years, and she devoted the rest of her life to the people of Jamaica. In fact, you know, you know the name Usain Bolt, the Olympic sprinter? He graduated from William Nibb High School in Jamaica. But what can we learn from the life of William Nibb? I have a couple of lessons. A preacher, I have to have lessons, right? The first one is this. The love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. If I had to choose a text for this biography, this would be it. The Apostle Paul clearly teaches us that when a desire for money grips the heart, any form of evil will follow after. And this is exactly what we see in the development and practice of slavery in Jamaica. In the beginning, it was the need for workers to plant and harvest the valuable sugarcane crops that drove the expansion of slavery. Remember the hymn writer William Cooper, um, there is a fountain filled with blood, uh, what else did he write? Many famous hymns, can't think of the rest at the moment. He wrote a poem called The Negro's Complaint in 1788. Listen to what he said. Forced from home and all its pleasures, Africa's coast I left forlorn to increase a stranger's treasures or the raging billows born. Men from England bought and sold me, paid my price in paltry gold, but though slave they have enrolled me, mines are never to be sold. Still in thought as free as ever, what are England's rights, I ask, me from my delights to slever, sever, me to torture, me to task. Fleecy locks and black complexion cannot forfeit nature's claim. Skins may differ, but affection dwells in white and black the same. Why did all creating nature make the plant for which we toil? Sighs must fan it, tears must water, sweat of ours must dress the soil. Think ye masters iron-hearted, lolling at your jovial boards. Think how many backs have smarted for the sweets your cane affords. Every time you drop sugar, Englishman, into your tea, think about those that are forced to harvest, to, to grow and harvest the soil. There's more in this, this wonderful poem, but time is passing away. Gold was not buried in the hills of the New World. It grew from the soil, and the planters enjoyed the benefits of it only because of the brutal system of slavery. They loved money, and they committed great evil as a result. The love of money is the fruit of all evil, the root of all evil, forgive me. Secondly, Paul says on his first missionary journey when he went back to visit the churches, we must through many tribulations enter the kingdom of God. Nib and those he served learned this by hard experience. The enemies of Christ will use every weapon in their power to hinder the spread of the gospel. We should not be surprised by this, but Nib's experience proves the point. He came to do good for the souls of men and women and children. But even this was perceived to be a work against the accumulation of wealth for the planters. They used every method of harassment and opposition to keep him from reaching the black slaves. Even the Anglican clergy in Jamaica collaborated with the planters. They owned and abused slaves. They perpetuated the English class system. They railed against the dissenters. It reads like a transcript of 1662 when 2,000 Puritans were forced out of the Church of England. And this harassment and persecution didn't end with emancipation on the 1st of August in 1838. There is a lot more to Nib's story. After emancipation, the planters ruthlessly attacked his character, still seeking to discredit him. They sought revenge against him, but he endured by the grace of God and by the strength of his character. Third thing that I want to say is this. From Acts 13, 36. 
David, after he had served the purpose of God in his own generation, fell asleep and was laid with his fathers and saw corruption. Listen to Matthew Henry's comment on this text. Here we have a short account of the life, death, and burial of the patriarch David and his continuance under the power of death. His life, he served his own generation by the will of God before he slept the sleep of death. David was a useful good man. He did good in the world by the will of God. He made God's precepts his rule. He served his own generation so as therein to serve God. He so served and pleased men as whatever the king did pleased the people, 2 Samuel 3.36, as, as still to keep himself the faithful servant of God. He served the good of men but did not serve the will of men. Or by the will of God's providence so ordering it, qualifying him for and calling him to a public station, he served his own generation for every creature is that to us which God makes it to be. David was a great blessing to the age wherein he lived. He was the servant of his generation. Many are the curse and plague and burden of their generation. Even those that are in a lower and narrower sphere must look upon it that they live to serve their generation. And those that will do good in the world must make themselves servants of all. 1 Corinthians 9.19 We were not born for ourselves, but are members of communities to which we must study to be serviceable. This is, in many ways, a description of William Nibb. He was a man of his times, and this made him a man ahead of his times. He saw and he understood what was happening around him. He labored to challenge and to correct the sins that he saw. And so I asked the question, do we serve our generation? Or are we molded by our generation? Do we see the sins of society around us and speak against them, even when it costs us to do so? Fourthly, let us not grow weary of well-doing, for in due season we will reap if we do not give up. So then, as we have opportunity, let us do good to everyone, and especially to those who are of the household of faith. Galatians 6, 9 and 10. Here's a promise to build upon. The scriptures tell us that we might grow weary in doing good. We may be tempted to give up. It's difficult to endure oppression and ridicule and persecution. Like the Galatian Christians, we may be tempted to slacken our pace because of fatigue, or like the Christians in the book of Hebrews, we may even be tempted to give up. But the truth is, the Lord prevails. We might not see the results of our labor, but that doesn't matter. The important thing is that we do the work of God and wait for him to bring about the good of that fruit. May God help us all to persevere in the face of trial and temptations. William Nibb was a great man. One of my heroes. But he wasn't a great man by the force of his character. He was a great man because he had a great God and because he trusted in his God at all times. Brothers and sisters, let us do the same. Let's follow William Nibb as he follows Christ, not because of who he was, but because he showed Christ-likeness in his life. Well, I hope that this has been interesting and encouraging a name you probably never knew before, but a man who deserves our thanks to God for his life and for what he did. Let's pray. Oh, Lord, there have been many men and women in the past who have served you well, who have endured, who have understood the need to love neighbor as oneself and who put the love of God first in their hearts. Thank you for the reminder of a man who has been obscure to us, but who did so much in your service, a national hero in the country of Jamaica, one of our brothers in the faith. Thank you for his life. Thank you more for his faith, his trust in you, his desire to follow you and serve you in all things. We give you praise, and we ask you to help us by, the, by your spirit, through your word, to give you honor, to keep the two great commandments, to love you, and genuinely to love our neighbors as ourselves. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Man, for the uh, Baptist in the